Yeah. I'm going to Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much. Uh, so, uh, hello everybody. Uh, so I want to talk about this this concept uh, of how we can use an ancient method that has been used by scientists for a few hundred years already with success. Take that and apply it to some computer science in many, many ways. Uh, but before I get to the actual story, uh, let me tell you why, how, how I actually came to this uh, idea. So originally I was uh, studying mathematics at the university. So I was a mathematics researcher. And then I decided to do a PhD in computer science. Uh, and then I became a developer, then a tech lead, then a product owner, then a dev, dev coach. So I have, I have basically ran around in different positions over the year, years. And, and I learned about a lot of things along the way. And uh, after a while, about a year ago, something clicked. And I had this epiphany that, oh my god, everything I learned so far is somehow linked to the same basic core concept. And my goal with today's uh, talk is to uh, give you that idea, give you that epiphany uh, that I had. To do that, first I want to talk about what, what is science. And actually I want this to be interactive, so uh, can you just shout in a few ideas? What, 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 would, what would you think science is? How would you define science? Okay, let me help you. Is it a belief system? Is it like something like a religion? No, yes. it's not, right? So, <laughs> it's not real. Uh, then, is it the quest for finding the truth about nature? Well, maybe. But there is one reason I would say that it's not really a quest for finding the truth. And that reason is uh, that a scientist is not happy when he knows the reality. Most of the time, uh, a scientist will be completely happy if there is a huge gap in his knowledge that he can feel gradually. We, we, we as scientists, we don't expect things to be completely true, whatever we use. Just let me give you an example. Newtonian physics, that's a model for the world. We, we can model uh, real world objects with Newtonian physics. Yet we know that it's not true because at large scales it breaks down. But we are completely happy to use that model for building, uh, building uh, cars, right? Because it's good enough at that scale. So, so for me, uh, science is a method for coming up with models that are good enough for modeling reality in a certain context. So, for example, if I want to be at a car, I want the model of, uh, of real world physics that is good enough for building a car. And when I want to fly uh, interstellar uh, with a, a spaceship, that's a different story. Then I don't, I'm not going to use Newtonian physics, then I'm going to use uh, relativity, right? So that's, that's, that's the thing that's important about science for me. And what is a scientific method? Well, it's a method for coming up with such models that work. And how does it work? Well, uh, it works like this. First, I'm going to set up a model. I will, I will have already a, a bunch of obvers, observations of how real world works. I have taken an apple and let it go and so that it falls. I make some uh, assumptions and I come up with a model. That's the first step. I have a model. And I want to make sure that this model is actually useful. So what I'm going to do is create an experiment that is somewhat surprising. Uh, what I'm looking for is something that no one has tried before, but my model says should work. So if my hypothesis is, or, or my model is uh, Newtonian physics, then I would want to have like a vacuum tube uh, where I can let go of an apple and uh, a feather at the same time and see that they fall at the same pace, right? 
So that's, that's the kind of experiments that we are looking for. We want to make sure that whatever predictions we make are correct. Then, we actually compare the result with what the model says. And this is the interesting part, because uh, if we are talking about uh, belief systems, there you, when, when some new information comes in and something is conflicting with our current worldview, we might not want to, we might not be happy about that. For science, it's the other way around. Great scientific uh, results uh, ha don't, so the, the sound of a great scientific result is not heureka. The sound of a great scientific result is, wow, that's strange. Because that's what we are looking for. We are looking for things that, that break our model because that shows that we have somewhere to tweak it. Okay? Okay, that's about science. Uh, and let's now move on. Yeah, and we, then what we do is we adjust and repeat. So whenever we, there is a result that doesn't fit our model, we are going to adjust the model. We are going to change it. Sometimes even create a completely new one. Well, not really, because relativity is, if you specialize it, it's actually uh, is similar to Newtonian physics at, at the context where Newtonian physics works. But the point is that we want to adjust and repeat. And that's, that's the scientific method. OK, uh, so now that we have talked about science, let's talk about uh, the purpose of software development. What is the purpose of software development? Again, any ideas? Making money. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a good guess. That's actually basically what I wrote here, creating <laughs> business impact. Now, of course, creating business impact is not enough. Uh, we want to create positive business impact, of, of course. <laughs> it's, a tad bit, it's a bit easier <coughs> to create negative ones, so that's important. Uh, but not just that, we actually want to minimize the lead time to business impact. Because if, if you have business impact five years from now, and your company runs out of money during that five years, then your business impact doesn't really count, right? So we want to minimize the lead time to that business impact. Oh, and by the way, we want to do that sustainably, because if we don't do that sustainably, then we, we can uh, run and, and create a lot of business impact in the first three months and then end up with a huge mess that we cannot do anything about and, and then, then we are back at not being able to create business impact. So we want to sustainably minimize lead time to business impact and all that in the context of high uncertainty. And that's the really important part for me here is that if you think about it, when we do software development, we have a lot of uncertainty. We, we don't know a lot of things. For example, we don't know what the customer actually wants. We don't know if the user will find that button that we just put there. So we don't know why our uh, system is slow. We don't know uh, what would be the ideal design for our software at the beginning. We don't know a lot of those things. So we have a lot of uncertainty. And that is something that, that is closely related to science. Because in science, we have the same situation. We, we have a lot of uncertainty, and we want to find the answer to, the, to these questions so that we can build a mad, better model for, for our uh, scientific endeavors. right? Uh, so it looks like that maybe the scientific method could be adapted to these kind of uh, situations. So what I'm going to do now is I, I'm going to create an abstract version of the scientific method that contains less context about science. And then we, we, are, we are going to specialize that abstract uh, concept to different uh, topics. And I'm going to run through a bunch of those uh, topics. OK, so what's the pattern? First, we establish a status quo. We want to find out what's our current situation. Then, we aim to disrupt that, uh, that status quo. We aim to do something that would tell us if our, our image of the world is correct or not. Okay? 
and then we are going to measure our progress. Did we actually make, did we actually uh, change our perception of the world or not? It, it, were everything that we saw before correct or did we find something that's not correct? And then we just repeat that until we are bored or, or whatever. Uh, okay, so that's pretty abstract at this point. It's hard to follow along. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to go through a lot of examples from our actual practices as developers and show you what I mean by this uh, method uh, in an actual real world. So first question that we might ask, are we building the right thing? That's, that's really important. Is this that we are building the thing that we can create a business impact with, right? Uh, so one of the methods that people use for that is Lean Startup, which was created by this guy there, Eric Ries. Uh, and he has a really good book uh, about it. And the, and the mantra in that book is build, measure, and learn. Now if you think about it, this, this is very similar, but let me put, rephrase this build, measure, and learn cycle in a way that ties back with our original uh, method. So first, you want to establish a metric and a baseline. This is, I want to create, uh, create a, find a metric that tells me uh, something I want to know. It, is, is that something true? And I will have a, a more concrete example for that in a second. Then we are going to, so basically what we do here is, a lean startup is about growing a, a startup from zero, right? You have a bunch of money and you want to create something valuable, some product that is valuable for, for the end users. And what I want to do is, for example, one metric would be how many users do I have subscribed? How many users are coming back? These are the kind of metrics we are looking at here. And then what we do is we are tuning the engine of growth, which is a concept in Lean Startup. Uh, you have three kinds of uh, growth engines. Uh, we have viral, uh, then we have subscription-based, and the third one is, hmm? did anyone read the book? Okay, anyway, I don't remember the third one. But it's, it's, uh, the point is that we want to do something that makes sure that we are growing, right? And then we measure if, if whatever we changed actually made, made, uh, made our growth faster, and after that, we either pivot or preserve. What does pivot mean? It means that we are going to change the direction of the company. We are not going to be uh, a streaming service for people who want to stream uh, videos from conference talks. We are going to be a streaming service for whatever else. Uh, OK, and this pivot? idea is so important that there is there was a, a comic running around in Silicon Valley for a while where a, a girl and a, a guy is sitting on a bench and then the girl says I'm not leaving you I'm just pivoting to another man <laughs> <coughs> uh, yeah <laughs> uh, so even more uh, concrete example so for example one metric could be how many subscribers do we gain each month uh, then we change the content to appeal to more, to more people. We are going to play around with the, the landing page, for example, and then we measure if we gain more subscribers than before, and then we change strategy or stay on track. That's, that's the startup for you in a nutshell. Of course, it's a long book, so I can give you all the details, but that's the basic concept. Okay, let's look at something else. Are we building the right things? So, how do we add features? Uh, how many of you do TDD? Just curious. Yeah, way, way too few people. More of you should be doing TDD. So, TDD is this. Uh, this is Ken Bat. He's the guy who came up with it. We write, write a failing test. This is our hypothesis. We think that if, if we are good, then this uh, test will check if we are done. Then we implement the feature see if the test passes, and then refactor and repeat. And basically what happens here is that we are not just making sure that uh, 
that we implemented the feature, but this refactor and repeat uh, step also makes sure that, so here the hypothesis is that our current design is correct. And then what we do is we write the feeling test, implement it, and see the test pass, and then we look at the code and see if the design is good. And if it's not, then we change the design so that it's good again. This is basically the, uh, the tweaking of the model, right? Okay, another one. Uh, Non-functional requirements. Uh, this is going to be a few more. Uh, and these are the ones that I think are more, most close related to Dev DevOps because these are, these are actually going to be Dev DevOps concepts. Um, so first of all, stability. We want uh, to make sure that our uh, software is stable, stable, right? So how do we do that? Well, uh, we first express the expected behavior as a test. Uh, then we create, oh no, so we express the uh, expected behavior. We, we say this is what we expect this piece of software to do. For example, I expect this piece of software to run every hour and move data from here to hit there, right? So I have this uh, expect, uh, ex expectation. And then uh, what I do is create an alert that verifies that my assumption that this piece of software is moving that data every hour is correct. And when I've done that, then I'm just going to lay back until I get an alert. Because if I get an alert, then I know my uh, original assumption that this software works is not correct. And then I repeat when alerted. Yeah, so that's, that's again something similar. Uh, another thing that we, we, we can do is, for example, if you know about an issue, that happened, for example, we got an alert, then how do we fix that alert? Well, we re reproduce the issue by an automated test. Uh, we implement the fix, check if the test turns green, and then repeat until fixed. Because we might actually uh, realize that, that the issue is still there and we have to write another test, right? So that's again, the same cycle. Uh, then what if we don't know where is the problem that we have to fix? We know what, what is the, uh, what is we get the alert for, or we know what kind of logs we have, but we don't know where is the, where is the actual program, what, what, what we need to fix. Well, then we can add more logs uh, to the code, find <coughs> checkpoints where we can add these uh, logs, deploy these logs, and, uh, and maybe even alerts, then observe the logs, learn from them, and repeat until we find, find where the actual issue is. How about performance? Uh, first, we set our performance goals, do a profile. We look at which part of the code is slow, we improve that part, profile again and compare, and if it's still slow, then we repeat until the goal is reached. How about user experience? That's another thing that we can uh, work with like this. First, we observe the user's behavior. This is the part where we actually <coughs> give them a task and just wait behind them and see what they do by trying not to disturb them with that. <laughs> so we observe the user, uh, and once we have observed the user, we know that we might have to change the workflow because we see that he, uh, he or she wasn't looking for the button on the top, she was looking for the button on the bottom left, then we are going to move that button because we think that that would be better for them. We observe the behavior again, and if, if they find the button quicker, then we are happy, right? And then repeat that. So these are, these are all things that, that, are, are fair, that we do fairly regularly. But I actually heard a really interesting in, uh, example from uh, one of our security guys uh, where they used a very similar process to come up with better password, password rules. So there is this problem that people use the same passwords over and over again, and, and like they, uh, everyone has a password like uh, city of birth and birthday, right? So that's, that's not good, and we, we want to uh, com uh, make people use better passwords. How could we do that? We can, we can maybe change uh, the password rules. One, of, one way to do that is uh, we actually look at what passwords are being used too frequently. 
then we change the password rules so that we can filter those, uh, we can make people not choose those passwords, right? We don't let them choose those passwords. And then we measure password quality. We actually look at, okay, we changed the rules, now people are using different passwords, that, but maybe a lot of them moved to another password that is similar. So, so they, they, they still have the same password, it's just that uh, it's a different password. And we do that until we find the, the password rules that make sure that people are actually uh, choosing different passwords. I, I found this really interesting, this example, because yeah, it's a, it's a very uh, concrete example of how you do that. Then let's talk about processes. Uh, I love processes. I like, love Agile, especially extreme programming. I think uh, Scrum is just a, a stripped down version of extreme programming. It's doing action programming is much better. That's my opinion, but it's worth uh, looking into action programming. But that's not my point right now. What I want to show you is that retrospectives are also uh, following this pattern. <coughs> what we do there, first, we collect our pain points. Uh, usually, we just sit around the table and everyone writes on on like these post-it notes there the things that were good that week or bad or, or things that should be done more or less, stuff like that. We put that on, up on the wall and then uh, group them into, into uh, talking points. And then what we do is discuss possible solutions to the pain point that we think is the more, most important, right? So for example, if we realize that every week we have 30 alerts, then we might have uh, that as a topic on the retrospective. And then we talk about it and, and we think about how we can reduce the number of alerts. That's, that's one example. And then what we do, we go, go away, we, we have like a, a solution that we think solves this problem. Then we go away, work for a week, and then we come back the next retrospective and look at uh, whatever we decided to do. Did we do it? And did it solve the problem? Right? So again, and then we repeat that every week. Uh, how about postmortems? That's another interesting thing, and that's also something that every DevOps team should do. Uh, postmortems. Well, first step, we discuss the timeline. We find out what happened, how we got to that uh, outage, right? Then we define the action items, whatever we want to do to make sure that this never happens again. After that, we review implementation. What did I mean by that? Anyway, so <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this slide was, was added two days ago, so maybe I wasn't, uh, I should have reviewed this one. Okay, so, but what I meant there is that we have the defined ac action items and we actually make, we have to make sure that people uh, act on those action items. And yeah, and then we review if they have done that, right? So we want to make sure that whatever we decided at the post-mortem actually happens. That's what I meant there. And then we repeat that whenever we have the next uh, outage. So these are many, many examples. And the thing is that you can, you can uh, apply that to different things. And maybe, maybe you already have something in your mind that, okay, this something else is also, also this cycle that we are talking about here. Or maybe you will have a problem in a few days or a few weeks and, and you don't know where to start and then you will think, okay, let's just start by defining whatever I think is true about this problem and then let's try to go through this process. I just want to give you a few tips about how, how you can go through this process if, 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 if you're new to it. So we had like three steps and repeat, right? The first step was observe. Observe means that I'm going to collect as much information as I can. And for that, my advice is work as a, as a team, get together in the room, and brainstorm. You can use post-its for this. You can use whatever tools that makes you think together. And come up with as many ideas as you can. And this is the phase where anything goes. Any stupid ideas is a good idea at this phase. All right? So this is observe. And uh, what you, yeah, and it's really important to create a safe environment. When we are in observation mode, 
then we want to make sure that nobody feels like they are being criticized for an idea because we want everybody to even say the stupid ideas, right? Then what we do is we are creating an experiment. And this is the part where you have to look for the metric. You have to find out what, I'm, what am I going to measure? What is going to tell me if I was successful with this change, okay? Uh, Usually that's the part when, where scientists also make sure that uh, they control for external variables, which means whatever happens outside of your control and may, may uh, mess up your measurements, you want to think of those problems. But usually that's, that's not uh, a big issue when we are uh, using it in software development, but it's something that you, you should be aware of uh, in some cases. And the other really important thing is when you experiment, address one thing at a time. Don't try to change everything at once. Because if you try to change everything at once, then you won't know which of those changes were good and which of those changes were bad. And that is why usually you should not have like one, more than one or two uh, action items after uh, a retrospective. Because retrospectives are about changing one thing at every, one thing every week, and be, uh, becoming better at one thing every week. And the reason for that is I want to make sure that the change that we made was good or bad. I want to find it out. And if I changed a bunch of things that, uh, together, then I won't know which one had which effect, right? So it's important when you do an experiment, make sure you are doing one change. Or at least if you are doing more, more than one change, make sure that, that those changes do not affect each other. And finally, we have to do the measurement. And this is the part where you actually, actually have to make sure that uh, your uh, assumptions are falsifiable. So when, when we think that, okay, I think if we do pair programming from now on, then we are going to go faster. <coughs> but if my measurements are not correct, then whatever happens, I will think that we have gone faster, right? Or, or the other way around. We have been pair programming, we think that we would go faster if we didn't pair program. And then if you don't have correct measurements, then you will be able to uh, reason yourself into thinking that you actually proved something when you haven't. So it's really important to uh, decide what, what are your expectations uh, at the experiment phase, so that when you do the measurement, you actually have something that, that there is a result that would change your mind about your uh, assumption that you made to begin with. Uh, so yeah, that's really important to determine whatever you expect in advance. And when you measure, you shouldn't change that, that expectation anymore. And always remember to check the results. That, that can happen a lot of times that you have uh, come up with a great idea, you implemented a lot of metrics, and then no one, nobody checks the dashboard ever. And then all that result, or all that effort that you put into creating that experiment and doing the measurements is in vain because you haven't checked the results. So always make sure to check the results. So finally, I want to, you, want to let you go with this. When we do software development, it's not a straight road. It's a winding road. And actually, this picture should be pitch black because usually we are driving in dark, right? <laughs> but this picture looks better than pitch black. So, uh, so the thing is, always think about uh, software development like this. You are just seeing whatever is in front of you and you want to steer your car in the direction where the road goes, right? And to do that, you actually need a method to make sure that you are going in the right direction. Be it, uh, be it making sure that your application is stable, be it user experience, be it making sure uh, that your company is actually creating value for your customers. Whatever you do, you want to make sure that you have a method that steers you along the way. And Ken Beck also said something interesting. He said, optimism is an occupational hazard of, of programming, and feedback is a treatment. 
And whatever, what he says here is basically that you have to make sure that you get feedback. And I think that these kind of applications of the scientific method are a really good way to get that feedback. So I challenge you to look for the pattern. Look for this pattern that I told you today. And so that you can do that easily, let me remind you about the pattern. First, we find out what we knew about a word, what we think is true. Then we decide to make sure that we change the word in some way, just in one way. And then we make sure that we measure if that change was actually good or bad. And finally, we repeat until we are bored. Thank you so much. Do we have any questions? Yeah. Uh, can you go back to the security part? The security part? Yeah, so the question is that how do you know the passwords? <laughs> <laughs> Good question. You will learn in. So, uh, yeah, uh, what, what you, that's a really good question. Uh, what you can do there, I think, okay, so that's, that's not the thing that I have done myself. That was done by the security team, so I don't know. No. Any other question? Yeah? <clears throat> Did you measure the effectiveness of uh, pair programming and how? <laughs> that's a really good question. <laughs> So, uh, the thing is, um, I don't think we have ever done that, uh, because what we measured was, uh, did it lead to more successful iterations? So, what, what was important for us is not how fast we are moving, but more, uh, are we finishing stories that we actually committed to? So, you did measure we, we did measure in some way, but, but we didn't measure how fast we are going. What we measured was, can we finish stories on time? Uh, and, and, and what we learned was that when we do pair programming, uh, then we don't, we, it's much r more rare to have a situation where, where most of the uh, story is done, and then there is just that extra mile that we didn't walk, because no one really knew what was going on. So they, we, we we don't forget like integration steps, right? So it, it helps in 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 spotting the problems with the with the initial uh, initial planning. So that's why we actually do pair programming a lot, because because even if it's slower, I don't know that if it's slower, but even if it's slower, it makes sure that whatever we finish is actually finished. Any any other questions? Yeah. Pair programming? Yeah, so, good question. Uh, I, I'm in a really nice situation because at Amorsis, upper management is really open to stuff. <laughs> so it comes from upper management. I'm in a company that uh, uh, proposed uh, Scrum and for every team. Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's that's much easier when it's coming from top to bottom. Uh, when when it's going the other way, then uh, it's mo a lot more challenging. And uh, so I was at a conference in Zagreb, uh, I think like two weeks ago, and uh, there was this guy. I, I'm not sure if you know him. It's his his name is Viktor Farcic, and he he's, he's like talking a lot of conferences. And Viktor said change the company or change the company. <laughs> <laughs> and, and I think he's, he's, he's pretty much clear on that. So if you cannot make sure, uh, if, if you think that the company is not going in the right direction, you can do two things. First, you can try to, to convince them into more sensible ways, but if you feel at that and, and when you are at like a huge company that is really hard to change, then sometimes you will have to say, I'm giving up, and then you can come and work at the Marsis. Yeah, I mean, we are still looking for people, so. <laughs>
you had a question? Uh, yeah, so uh, is really uncertain fun? I mean, uh, uh, it goes away when you find out what exactly the client wants, etc. What are you well, saying? Well, the thing is, the point is not that this uncertainty goes away with this process. The point is that this process makes sure that you can uh, turn as much uncertainty into certainty as, as fast as you can. It, it's a process for making sure that whatever uncertainty is bothering you, you get to a solution. But initially you said that uncertainty is what you want and, the, and what you know, the complex rule is what you... What I said you is that, that uh, scientists are okay with uncertainty. They, I didn't say they wanted uncertainty. They want to be certain about things, but they are okay with saying that this is the part that we don't know yet, with <coughs> yet being the, the important part. Because then we go and do a bunch of work, and then we have less uncertainty, and we have some answers around that uncertainty. Last question. Well, thank you so much.